live from San Francisco with Professor Bredesen, who published in 2014 a novel approach to reverse certain cases of Alzheimer's dementia, and I've been learning more about the protocol here over the last few days. Professor Bredesen, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Can you tell me a little bit about your work? Yeah. So we have been interested for many years in the fundamental mechanisms underlying neurodegenerative disease, especially with cognitive decline, and especially with pre-Alzheimer's conditions and Alzheimer's disease. And we've been looking at the, the many inputs that really define a plasticity network that goes awry in Alzheimer's disease. Wow, and your results have been very impressive. For me, I remember when the paper came out in October 2014, it really had a big impact on me because it was, for me, almost like a paradigm shift about how you would look at a condition. You're looking at a multi-pronged approach to tackling something that we've always looked for, you know, a single intervention. So the idea of a monotherapy of a single pill is really a very old-fashioned concept. Yeah. It's great when you think about pneumococcal pneumonia because you're dealing with something fairly simple. But when you look at the complex chronic illnesses that affect us today, whether you're talking about cancer, whether you're talking about osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes, or Alzheimer's disease, these are complex chronic illnesses. And so the idea of monotherapeutics is really evolving to an idea of programmatics, where you look with much larger data sets at all the inputs and then you can address each one of them. So the idea is to get a personalized program. Uh, the idea is the same as precision medicine, same idea, to look yeah. at the mechanisms that are actually driving the condition. Yeah, I mean, the results are truly impressive. I think you published 14 cases. The original 10, we have over 100 now. Over 100 now, fantastic. And you know, in terms of people watching, are there common symptoms uh, that these sort of patients present? And what, are the, what are the early signs for people to right. look out for? Right. Well, one of the things we found is that if you do these more general and more complicated uh, metabolic profilings and genetic profilings, we found that there are actually five different types of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and within those, what we find is that there are specific things that we can address with each one. They present often, as you know, uh, with an amnestic syndrome. That's common for the, what we call type 1, type 1.5, and type 2, where the typical thing is that people will come and not have the ability to store new information. And it's interesting because if you look at the, the plasticity network characteristics, um, there is a downsizing that actually occurs. So the first thing that goes, just like a company, the first thing that would go is hiring new people. The canary in the mine for this plasticity network in your brain is the inability to learn new information. So for a while at least, you keep the old information, how to drive, how to work, how to add, how to speak, all that but you lose the ability to add new information. Is that something you notice yourself as the patient, or is that something more that your family and friends notice about you? Right, uh, both. So both. people typically notice, I can't remember things anymore, but you're absolutely right. The spouse is the common person who will say, we went to dinner last night, and he or she asked me the same thing three times. Beginning of dinner, a few minutes later, and then at the end of dinner, and that's telling them immediately something's wrong. They never would have done that before. Wow. I mean, one thing I've realized at 15 years as practicing MD is that often in conventional modern medicine, we wait until something is established right. and that there's a lot of um, disability associated with it before we get involved. And what's interesting about your program is that not only can it reverse, you know, certainly the early and moderate stages of Alzheimer's dementia, or certainly a lot of those cognitive areas, but also it might be used as a preventative strategy. Right, and we're using with a number of people now as prevention. We've had so far very good results with it. So you're absolutely right. One of the huge problems is that because people believe that nothing can be done, they wait as long as possible, which is exactly the opposite of what should be done. So if you are at risk, if there's Alzheimer's in your family, you should come in when you hit 45 years old, get checked out at that time biochemically, genetically, um, potentially with imaging, look to see where you stand so that you never have the problem. Then, if, as you begin to get the earliest symptoms, the earlier you come in, the better off things will be. Wow. And for me, another really interesting point is that not only did people get better on sort of subjective parameters, but objectively, you, you measured a, an increase in hippocampal size. So we see increases, not only improvements in people going back to work and things like that, but also uh, increases in hippocampal volume. We see improvements in quantitative neuropsych testing. So these are things that uh, are not just placebo effect. These are objective improvements. Absolutely. I think on your first day when you were presenting here, I, 
I think you mentioned that 30 million people maybe globally have Alzheimer's disease at the moment, and that's forecast to be 160 million by 2050. Exactly right. But that's a huge increase. You mentioned the APOE4 gene and the evolutionary context of why we may be getting so much Alzheimer's these days. Um, can you expand on that a little bit? Sure. So APOE4 is a, a gene that actually appeared with the hominids. So it was part of our evolution from simians that have their own APOE to hominids that began with APOE4. And so from 96% of human evolution, um, it has only been APOE4. Everyone was an APOE4 homozygote, two copies of APOE4. Just in the last 220,000 years, which seems like a long time, but it's relatively short in human evolution, um, we've had APOE3 appear, which is now the dominant gene. So uh, what happens though is that there are a quarter of people typically who have APOE4, one copy, and then about 2%. So in the US, 7 million Americans are APOE4 homozygotes and they have a 90% chance, each one, of developing Alzheimer's during their lifetime. 90%. So, all, so all of these people should be identified so that we can help make sure that they never get it, and we are working with a number of these people now. So for the future, the hope is that we would identify and prevent this in all of these people. Then there are 75 million Americans who have a single copy of APOE4, and they are at 30% risk. And then for the remainder, uh, they are at about a 9% risk during a lifetime of developing Alzheimer's disease. Wow. Well, look, Professor Redison, I think your work is truly groundbreaking. It's really exciting to be involved with bringing some of it to the United Kingdom. And for those of you who are watching, uh, Professor Redison is going to be in the UK on Thursday, the 8th of September, speaking to people both in the day, uh, nutritional therapists, the public, but also for medical doctors in the evening at the Royal Society of Medicine. So we look forward to having you over in the UK and thank you for your time. Great. Thanks very much, Rocky. Thanks very much.